Welcome to the On Your Side podcast. I'm Gary Harper. And I'm Susan Campbell. How is Susan today? I'm good. Not bad, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a little, it's wet and it's chilly outside. You have no sleeves on, so I know you're a little chilly. I've got a sweater downstairs. How was the weekend? It was good. Mm. It's always too fast. Yeah. I took a couple of days off, went to D.C. Enjoyed the did weekend. The, I did the whole tourist thing, got into uh, inside, actually, the White House. That was a great tour. That's awesome. Inside the U.S. Capitol. Had you been before? No. So this was the first time. That was fun. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, you know, we just kind of went on the shell of the White House because you can't get like the inside. Uh, inside. Yeah. I mean, but this is the inside. I mean, we saw rooms and stuff where presidents have entertained and, uh, so you know, fun. in the past. Oh, man, it was free. It was great. It was How like, is it free? Well, I mean, listen, it's taxpayers. You know, we pay for that stuff. So you get to go. Yeah, I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, everybody gets to go. I didn't realize yeah, that. Which, but you have to reserve three months in advance. Oh. They like to do background on you, make sure you're, you know, I'm surprised I passed. <laughs> <laughs> they gave Gary Harper the go ahead. The go ahead, yeah. I guess I was clean. I'll have to call them and say, I don't know. You know, I was a little worried about How that. How did he slide through the cracks? I was a little worried about that warrant <laughs> I have. I'm like, is that warrant going to come up on the Secret Service database? Oh, gosh. So, um, anyway, great times. Good to awesome. be back. Nice to see you. Um, here we are in, in January. It's going by so Very end of January. I, it, it, where did it go? I mean, it was here and then psh, it's gone. So and what I'm leading into, of course, is February is going to be here. March, April. I mean, we've got to get our noses to the grinding stone when it comes to taxes. Have you? Wah, e wah, wah. It's, 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 you got to do it. Have you even, I mean, have you dug out the boxes yet? Have you put the paperwork I together? I have not put the paperwork together, but there are a couple of things, you know, I've gotten the emails from the kids' schools with, you know, the, the amount of money we've spent on child care mm. that we need those forms. Yeah. So there are a handful of things that I know where they are. Yeah. At so least. <laughs> I have a CPA that's going to do it all for me. Oh, I mean, I, yeah. I, I can't trust myself to do it because... I don't have anything complicated enough to deal with that. Well, it's not the complication. I just it's, do it myself. It's just... Do you do the, the, um, the um, software? I, I have used a couple different kinds of software, yeah. Okay, and it's all good. Uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. IRS hasn't had, come back. I mean, no. Nobody's knocked on my door. <laughs> no red flags that said... Oh. I mean, I'm always the standard <laughs> deduction, you know? Like, what are they going to... What oh, are they going to be confused about? The standard deductions, that's a big one. And we're going to talk about that because standard deductions right now are so high. I don't even think people are going to, you know, really even have enough to get over that threshold. So for more on that, I mean, there's things we got to know so about. So many new things. So many new things. We're talking to Mark Stieber. He's the chief tax information officer at Jackson Hewitt. He's also the company's liaison with the Internal Revenue Service. How are we today, Mark Stieber? Well, that's an exciting time. I'm loving life right now. It's the giveaway tax refund time to people, so couldn't be brighter. Well, listen, you're a friend of the On Your Side podcast because you were with us last tax season, so thank you again for being with, with us again. Uh, when it comes to filing taxes this year, um, top of your head, what's the latest and greatest thing wh that we need to know? File earlier rather than later for a variety of reasons. I know it's a, uh, it's an unseemly task, taxes, but the later you wait, the more bad things that happen. I'll simply start it with that. All right. And tell us what. What bad things happen if you wait too late? Well, first of all, three out of four Americans get a refund every year. That's about 100 million people on average, uh, you know, and they average about a $3,000 refund. And so the first thing I tell people is, I know it's taxes, but if you file early, you get money early. You don't have to be a financial wizard or Warren Buffett to know that makes sense. Why would you wait for four months to get money someone owes you? You don't wait for your employer to pay you four months. In fact, I wouldn't tell you your employer you're okay with not getting your money for three or four months. They might have a new company policy for you people. So file early, get your money early. It's pretty simple. But a more important reason is with all the dark web and data breaches activity out there, if you file early, you lock up your data early with the IRS and your state. If you wait till later, somebody who may have bought your data or seen you on TV says, hey, I bet they make a lot of money. I wonder how hard it is to buy their social security number. Costs about a dollar. Then they'll file a tax return and steal your refund. So reason number two to file early, lock up your data, lock up your spouse, lock up your kids. Now, the one thing I often hear that's a myth is I'm going to owe this year my side gig income, my self-employment, my crypto made some good money. You know, I'm going to owe, I'm definitely going to wait till I have some cash. 
No, wrong, bad again. If you owe money, it's always a good idea to find out exactly how much you owe so you can start to work towards a savings plan. If you file early, you figure that out, and here's the tip for your viewers. You still don't have to pay till April 15th. Filing is separate from paying. The two are not related. So file early if you do a refund, like 100 million people, get that money. That seems kind of smart. File early, lock up your data. You lock your house, you lock your car. You know, that seems kind of smart. And if you owe somebody a big bunch of money, file early, figure it out, protect your data, and you still have three or four months to arrange for payment. And even then, there are some payment options if you can't raise the cash then. So there's no real good reason, you know, once you have your documents, which next Wednesday will be the deadline for that, to file your taxes. You have convinced all of us. Yeah, no kidding. Let's now, do it. You said three $3,000 is the average refund. Um, I mean, that, people need to understand that's $3,000 that they overpaid in taxes. I mean, this is not like just free $3,000 that they're going to be getting. This is just money that they overpaid Uncle Sam. It is their money, and it's not coming automatically, and it's not going to come fast. You have to pull the trigger on that and get that form in to get your money. Absolutely true. Walk us through what we need to be gathering, because I think that in this very beginning stage of tax season, uh, people are kind of going, I have other things to worry about or think about, and I don't know what ta I have to gather. So it is kind of easy to put it off till next weekend and then next weekend and then next weekend. And all of a sudden we're coming up at the deadline. What are the, th the handful of papers that we need to grab right now? Well, I like to keep it simple because I have found whether it's through exercise or whether it's through project management or whatever it is. If it's not easy, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so I recommend everybody with their get ready plan to keep it simple. I like the envelope. I like the shoebox. I like the Pandaflex folder. But most importantly, I like you to keep it organized in four categories. I like a section called the income section. Your W-2s, your 1099s, dividends, interest, broker statements, crypto rental, whatever income item you have that you're going to get a statement and you need to have that statement to do your taxes, that's part one. Part two is your deduction section. And part two can be a, a whole lot of different things depending on if you've got a small business or self-employed or if you've got, uh, you know, uh, itemizers, if you own a home and you're going to take those deductions, mortgage interest, property taxes, state income taxes, sales taxes, charitable donations, medical. But if you're an itemizer, and that's more people than you think, not as many as before the giant standard deduction, but it's not just limited to itemizers, but deductions and credits on your tax return. The third section, and this is the critical section in my opinion, you know, tax law changes every year, but more important than tax law changes are life changes. You know, you don't see these items on the front page of any social media, but life changes are more common and have a bigger impact. For example, getting married or getting divorced, those are kind of obvious. Having a child, adopting a child, fostering children, again, kind of obvious. Then you start getting into the less, you know, spectacular ones, but just as big an event. Starting a side gig activity, you know, hobby or full-time or part-time does not matter. If you're making money, you've got an activity that needs to be tracked, and we'll get to the 1099K in a moment, but if you've got business activity, new or otherwise, that's a pretty big life change. Taking care of elder parents, big life change that we're seeing. Retiring, perhaps one of the biggest life changes. You know, going back to college or having a family member in school, big life change, and the list goes on and on and on, and each one of these has an enormous impact on your tax return, much bigger than some of the legislative changes that you'll see. So that four sections of your envelope or your shoebox can jumpstart both your confidence in what you're doing, your tax pro, whoever that might be, or whatever method you're going to use to get your taxes. And year one's a tough year to start to get it, but year two you just replicate or create a checklist or whatever it is to help you get organized. But you need to do something other than just you put them in one spot, your spouse puts them in another, maybe this one didn't come, I'll worry about it later, by then you know, you've forgotten all about it, but the IRS didn't. You want to have an organized plan, a calendar of events, and you want to attack it with some veracity because it is your largest single financial transaction year after year. For many Americans, it's their largest single payday. And to shortcut it, to do it on your smartphone, on the bus ride into work, you're just going to leave something off. And here's my last tip on that question. If you leave off a benefit, if you leave off a credit, if you leave off a deduction, federal or state, it makes no difference. Those people are not going to go, oh, Gary left this office tax return. We need to send him more money. That is not how it works. 
They come after your money. They don't send you more money. Leave it off. It stays off and it stays off forever until you fix it. You mentioned some of the legislative changes, what you and we talked about all of the life changes that people can experience. But what are some of the changes that are happening this year um, just from the IRS that we need to know about? Well, 2023 was a pretty good year. There were some changes, statutory, increased standard deduction, it's bigger. Changes in the tax rates, they're a little bit lower. Changes in the earned income credit, it's bigger. Right towards the end of the year, uh, I think as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, there was a, a flurry of legislation on green energy credits. So if you bought a, an alternative fuel vehicle in 2023, or if you did home improvements in 2023, you know, you put in some insulation, windows, doors, alternative fuel generator, even an energy study, uh, there's a credit for this year, you know, as a part of that uh, energy credits uh, battery of tax changes. But again, I go back to the life changes are bigger. And if you've got small business or self-employed activity, like 40 million people do, and you're getting that 1099 NEC non-employee comp or 1099 miscellaneous, you know, there's a whole host of different discussions that we need to have about what you need to be keeping in the way of records and documents and deductible items. So a lot to watch and a lot to watch out for. Mark, I have a question about um, itemizing things because that used to be really, really big back in the day. You'd find as much as you could to itemize in order to bring down your taxable uh, income. For instance, you'd put on your mortgage uh, interest. Um, any anything else that you might be able to find, maybe uh, medical bills to bring that down. But because the deductions have been raised to such a high limit now, I think for married couples, it's $27,700. It's high. It's really difficult to get over that high deductions, correct? Well, it is difficult now because they did raise it, and that was kind of the tax simplification goal of the super standard deduction. That being said, a lot of people who can itemize, and that's principally homeowners, you know, just take the fast way out, and they leave money on the table, and the government doesn't come around. So I would simply say this. If you're not a homeowner, you're probably a standard deductor because, as you say, it's a pretty big number, and it's even bigger if you're a senior citizen where they give you an even bigger standard deduction. On the other hand, if you're a homeowner and you're paying mortgage interest and property taxes and maybe even a state income tax, it's something that's worth its while to keep track of to see where you are in comparison. Because 25, 27,000, you know, is a pretty big number till you got a pretty big mortgage and pretty big property taxes and pretty big state income tax. Then you're over the hump. And for your viewers who don't know, you get to pick the better of the two. How great a situation is that? You get the standard deduction, but if you've got itemized deductions that are more than that, you take the bigger. But you're not required to, and it's easier just to take the standard on that do-it-yourself software and leave thousands of dollars in tax refund at the IRS and at the Treasury, and they're, again, not going to call you about that. So if you're a homeowner, and that's one of those big life changes, I'll tell you everybody should look at it because it's more than just mortgage interest, property taxes, sales taxes, state income taxes, medical, and charitable. You add all those up, and if it's bigger than that standard, then, then you get the bigger of the two. But it's not something to be dismissed, uh, I promise you. I see it every year. People just go with the easy, fast way and leave that money. Much smaller than it was, say, five years ago or ten years ago, but it's still available if you own a home principally. That's right. that's really – I'm sorry, Susan. That, that's a really good um, um, advice there. But it's still going to be challenging because interest rates were, were so low, it seems like. A lot of people have like a 3%, maybe even 2.8%. But So it's that interest is really hard to write off, but you really need to put it in there anyway because you, you might get above that – 27,000 uh, deduction if you're married. By the way, what is, for our single filers out there, what is it, uh, the deductions? Well, and I don't have the specific amounts in front of me. Uh, I'll get that for you, and if somebody will text me that, I'll have it. Yeah. Long story short, uh, it is a big number, and you're exactly right, but I got to tell you, the 3% interest rates, I haven't seen those in a couple of days uh, for home buyers in the, the last year or yeah. three. So uh, I'm starting to see higher and bigger, and a lot of those people that were in those ARMs or adjustable rate mortgages, they have also uh, ballooned on up, you know, to a much bigger number. So, you know, it is something to look at, to look at every year. And I'll give you another group that overlooks it quite often more so than you might imagine. It's your senior group. It's your retirees. Yeah, they get a pretty healthy standard deduction until they have a catastrophic health care situation, in which case some of that might not be insured, and you can creep up past the standard deduction with a major medical cost 
pretty quick fashion. And again, you just miss that, and the government's not going to come and find that for you. So long, long story short, uh, and I think the single's 13850 for 2023. So $14,000 is your standard deduction for a single. Pretty healthy. Uh, you're exactly correct. Yeah. But... You know, if you're a single senior and you've got heart or whatever, or if you're a single homeowner and you don't have 3% interest rate, which I promise you, I, I don't think there's many of those floating around, you know, you'll get past that 13000 pretty quick. And mm -hmm. then if you're in a high property tax state with income and you donated anything to charity, bang, you're in the itemizer category. But for speed and efficiency, you just hit that button on that self-prep software, got it done, and you high-fiving yourself, you left $5,000 at the treasury, not a good answer. Mm -hmm. For people who are itemizing, what are some things that people think might be deductible but actually aren't? Walk us through some of maybe <laughs> the pitfalls or the things that have tripped people up before. Yeah, there's there's no limit to that one, I will tell you. <laughs> I'll say uh, living down in Florida, I'm often found in quite a big disagreement on the people who think their family pet is a family member <laughs> and they pay all sorts of costs, and that is a little chi chi. He's deductible. No, your pets are not deductible. <laughs> little I'm chi chi. He's, he sounds uh, cute, though. <laughs> he does, yeah, little so, chi chi. Probably a little chihuahua. Funny. Uh, that neighborhood kid that's over at my house 20 hours a day eating my food, <laughs> playing on my stuff, that's my dependent. No, no, there are some specific <laughs> rules on family dependency. So there's really no shortage. But I'll tell you, the bigger crime is not the crazy thing people claim that can't be claimed. We can get through that list pretty amazingly quick. The bigger crime is for the deduction that people leave off and they didn't realize was deductible. Perhaps not so much with the uh, itemizing, although charity is a big one, but the self-employed people don't realize that there's an entire battery of deductions if it's related to their income earning activity. And that's an enormous list as well. And if you leave it off, I harp on this, it stays off. So if you didn't realize some of your business gifts or your automobile or your cell phone charges or your computer or your home office were tax deductible, you leave them off, they stay off, you pay too much in tax. And again, no one's going to catch that for you unless you take action and hire someone to look at it or you do your homework yourself. So the left off deduction or the left off benefit. Now finish on this one. Earned income credit, it's well north of six thousand four hundred dollars you know at the maximum one in five fail to take that every year every year and that's an enormous program with an enormous pr budget but one out of five forget to take it every year and you know and the irs again does not call you up and say here's another six thousand dollars you know here's that contested custody child that really is yours because the ex claimed it first it's really yours Here's another $4,000. They don't send you that money unless you do it. And that self-prep model sometimes shortcuts that at the expediency of a painful activity, but you leave money on the table, perhaps thinking that somebody will catch it on the back end like they would a credit card credit or a debit. It doesn't work that way for your taxes. That was brutal just to think about that money. Yeah, leaving it on the table. Um, let me drive something home to our, our viewers and our listeners, and that is um, if, even if you think you can get above the standard deductions and you get lazy and you say, I'm not going to get above it, so I'm not going to itemize. Here in Arizona, it's extremely important that you do itemize because I'll give you an example, and you probably already know this, Mark. Here in Arizona, um, your out-of-pocket medical expenses are tax deductible, even though it, they may not be on the federal side. On the state side, they are. So you need to itemize every single thing because there might be other categories out there that you itemize that could be tax deductible in your state. For instance, again, in Arizona, uh, your medical deductions are, are taken into consideration. So that's really important. Well, and, and you hit on a great point there, and I'll simply say it on this. States are their whole system of sovereign tax rules. Mm -hmm. They don't piggyback on the Fed hardly at all anymore. And there's 42 states with an income tax. So anything, whether it's the earned income credit, states sometimes have a piggyback that's much different. And so the state tax returns have become, one, more complicated, two, a lot more money. And it doesn't need to be $6,400 like the earned income credit. You mess up a state by ignoring the itemized point that you just made, you may forfeit four or 500 bucks. That would have paid a tax pro in a minute, plus they may have found something else, plus they may have made your day less stressful. So states are often the redheaded, unwanted uh, other you know, sibling that you don't want to pay attention to, but the reality is there's money there as well. Mm -hmm.
Can I talk to you or ask you about people uh, with side gigs? A couple years ago, the IRS said people who have side gigs or get income over $600 through any of these uh, cash apps, you know, the Zells, the Venmos, things like that, we're going to start getting those forms. And that was going to have to be included in taxes. And that has kind of been put on pause and now put on pause again, I believe. Uh, where do things stand with that? And what do we need to know if we are one of these side giggers who's getting paid through Venmo or the, the babysitter who's watching my kid who I'm Venmoing? What do I need to know about that? Well, and that's a great question and one that was set for the biggest tax change of the year when the 1099K rule for 2023 was $600 and one transaction. But first, let me start off by saying here's the big myth on side gig or hobby income. There's no exclusion. There was no law change that says if I'm making more than $600. The rule is if you have a dollar of income from other activities, that's supposed to go on your tax return. Hobby, de minimis, $20,600, that is not the rule. If you have a dollar of other income, babysitting, you're supposed to report that. Now, you may not pay taxes on it because of the standard deduction and a whole bunch of other things, but income is income unless it's specifically excluded, like life insurance, for example, not taxable. You know, uh, you know other things are not taxable. Tax-exempt interest, not taxable. Income from a side activity, taxable until it's not. And so the rule that was changed was the IRS recognizes that maybe not everybody's paying their fair share, partly because of the $800 billion annual tax gap, partly because of the $35 trillion national debt. The IRS needs to start getting that money. So they passed this rule four years ago that said, if you're getting money from an electronic platform, more than $600 in a year, you're going to get a 1099K. And oh, by the way, so is the IRS. Well, that created a great deal of angst with people going, well, my goodness, that's going to create all kinds of problems. Yeah, it is. And so they kicked the can down the road last year. But 2023 was the lock year. Well, come to 2023, end of the year, they've again said, I don't know what we're going to do with 40 million 1099Ks. So they, again, continued to kick the can down the road. But as of 2024, the rule's kind of in place. They put another bit of a transition. I think it's 5,050, you know, and we'll see how that plays out. The point is this to your viewers. If you've got side gig income, big, small, part-time, hobby, not my real job, that's taxable income whether you choose to report it or not. Once the man finds out or your angry ex finds out, you're probably in harm's way. Suffice to say, when they kick this rule off, you don't want to have them looking back one year and going, let's go back three or four years and see what we see. So you want to be compliant, and a tax pro can help you with that because there's a lot of sweet deductions, a lot of sweet you know, elections that can reduce your income, but leaving it off because Uncle Bob, the tax pro, said it's not taxable because it's under $20,000 or under $600 or it's a hobby, not true, wrong, eh. So you need to get good guidance, whatever your choice of morality and tax compliance is. But if it's income, it's taxable. And it may be a loss. If you've got a loss, it may be deductible and offsetable against your regular wages. And you're giving that up, too. So there's a lot to know and a lot to watch out for. But there is no de minimis rule. There is no $600 rule. There is no $20,000 rule. There is no hobby rule. There is a we don't have to have a 1099K until $20,000 for 2023. 2024, we'll call that fluid, we'll see. Fluid and we'll see. I have a prickly question here prickly. because, well, it, it, gets okay. a, it gets a little uncomfortable for some people because they don't know if they want to put it in there or not. And that is because of the pandemic. A lot of people started working from home. They had to buy equipment, desks, computers, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people are now still working from home. So what about a home office is... That, it, it, that gets a little dicey, doesn't it? Because people are telecommuting. They do a lot of their work from home. Uh, how does the office uh, deduction come in, home office? Great, great urban myth. I have an office at home. I'm going to get audited. It raises my audit risk, my audit profile. Not true, wrong, false. A home office has no correlation between getting audited, taking it or not. Never seen it in my 30, 40 years of business. That being said, the rules are real simple on the home office. And one of the points that was made earlier, you haven't been audited. Well, 
let me give you some bad news. The IRS turned off the audit function three years ago during the pandemic out of an abundance of understanding. So they haven't been doing audits, not for good people, not for bad people, not for rich people, not for poor people. They just have not been. That being said, they're getting ready to gin that machine back up. So don't get a false sense of security from anywhere that there haven't been any audits on my taxes. I don't mean you specifically. The IRS has just not been auditing because of the pandemic. First, they couldn't send people out because they didn't want to get them infected. And two, you know, it just wasn't a really smart gig. They're going to do that sooner rather than later. We've got all that debt. That being said to your question, if you've got a home office related to your self-employment, you take that all day long. And if you're not, you're just throwing money away. On the other hand, if you're an employee not self-employed, you don't get the home office. That being said, you can put it on your tax return, and right now you won't get audited till they turn it back on. And then they say, wait a minute, he's got a home office and no self-employment income. Bang, you're going to get a notice saying, hey, we need to know where that self-employment income is. Because oh, only self-employed people get the home office. Now, I've seen a lot of amended do-it-yourself returns where they took that return deduction because you can take it. You just don't get it. And those two are fundamentally different approaches on your tax preparation. You can take anything. You can take Chi-Chi the dog as a dependent. It doesn't mean once they come a-looking that, how does the Johnny Cash song go, when the man comes around? Well, the man's getting ready to start coming around. Get compliant. Don't play around no. with the man, no. a.k.a. the Internal Revenue Service. Oh, boy. And the man needs dues, and he's looking for dues. He, he wants those dues. He <laughs> wants the money. Hey, listen, Mark, if people want to know more about uh, your uh, Jackson Hewitt or you, just give us some websites or anything you want to do. JacksonHewitt.com. It's your one-stop shop. We've got videos. We've got checklists, what to do. And uh, for the young lady, how to find an office so they can do that free look-back review and kind of get you compliant with some of that DIY. I'm sure you took the child credit and the dependent care credit and the other dependent credit on your tax return. Even though if you don't itemize, you still get those. But uh, JacksonHewitt.com, videos, checklist, find an office, put your zip code in, up the pizza map pops. You click on office, make an appointment, or walk right on in. We're open for business right now. We're giving people refunds. Uh, but I will simply say, it is your single largest financial transaction. Pay some attention to it, not you two in particular. It's a big deal. 100 million people getting refunds starting on Monday. Uh, get after it because it will not be automatic and it will not be uh, without some action on your part. All right, Mark. Thanks so much. And again, you're a friend of the On Your Side podcast. We will, uh, we'll be talking to you again uh, down the road, okay? Be here all for the next 90 days. I appreciate you. Thanks so much, Mark. The On Your Side podcast is produced by Brad Denny. Our audio engineer and editor is Todd Martin. Segment producer is Colin Stanton. And I'm Gary Harper. And I'm Susan Campbell. If you have a problem you can't resolve, maybe we can't, send us a message through azfamily.com or our AZ Family mobile app. Look for the On Your Side section and leave us a message. Thanks so much for listening to the On Your Side podcast. And if you like it, leave us a review. We'll see you next week. On Your Side is on Good Morning Arizona every weekday morning at 645 and 7 o'clock and every weekday evening on Good Evening Arizona at 4 and 5 o'clock. You can also catch it on Arizona's Family News at 9 on 3TV every weeknight.